Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Welcome back, folks, to another episode. It is Shay here, and today we are visiting with Dr. David Lallman at Oklahoma State University. He is a professor in their animal and food sciences department and has a heavy emphasis on nutrition and the, in the cow-calf segment. Now, we are going to be talking about little cows, big cows, moderate-sized cows, feel a little bit like uh, the Dr. Seuss book there saying that, red fish, blue fish, one fish, two fish. But it's really an insightful conversation where we talk about the efficiency of these different cows and how cow-calf producers can be mindful of their input costs and select for cows that have the appropriate amount of production and are still efficiently utilizing that forage. Now, I do want to remind you that the best way to support this podcast or any other podcast is to give a rating or review on your favorite listening app and share an episode with a friend if you enjoy it. The best way podcasts grow are word of mouth and the more ratings and reviews we have on those listening apps. That helps Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever you're listening on share it with other people. It helps us pop up faster in those search bars. From all podcasters, I think I'm just going to say thank you in advance to anyone who has and will give us a rating and review. But with that, let's visit with Dr. Lallman. Hey folks, have I told you about my favorite app to manage all of the data for our cow herd? We made the switch to Breeder and it has saved us Hours from basic inventory management, calving records, treatments, reminders, weights, running reports, and exploring different marketing avenues for your calves, Breeder has you covered. One of the best parts is they also work with multiple supply chains, so they can offer another marketing outlet for your cattle. We can then choose to get carcass data back through the Breeder app. This will help inform our breeding choices for next year and also prove and improve the quality of beef we're ultimately producing. I think Breeder is going to be a game changer for producers like us, and I'm excited for you to check it out. To learn more, head to Breeder.co. That's B-R-E-E-D-R dot C-O. And the link is in the show notes. All right. Well, we are here with Dr. David Lallman today, and we are going to be talking about cow efficiency. Before we dive into your definition of an ideal cow and a little bit more about what makes her efficient, can you talk a little bit about what your role in the beef industry is today and briefly introduce yourself to those listening? I can do that. So thank you for having me, Shay. Uh, My background, uh, actually I was raised in southeast Kansas on a diversified family farming operation uh, where we raised corn, soybeans, wheat, and milo. Not so much milo grown in that part of the world any any more interestingly uh, because they've changed the corn crop so much. But uh, from there, uh, and we had livestock, we had swine operation and, and beef cattle operation as well. Went to school at Kansas State University uh, for my undergraduate degree and then on to Montana State University for a master's and worked at the beef unit out there as a, a, I guess you'd call it a herd manager for several years while I was working on a master's degree and then finished up or did a PhD program at the University of Missouri uh, in the fescue belt while I was working on my PhD and and so in that position there for five years I had an extension appointment so worked with ranchers or farmers and ranchers around the state of Missouri and uh, that led to an opportunity here in Oklahoma and so uh, here I have a split extension and research appointment and uh, work with farmers and ranchers throughout the state of Oklahoma and, and kind of the surrounding region so that's that's my responsibility as you know most of my work is in the cow calf nutrition and management area and yes we have been you know really focused in recent years on this idea of improving uh, cow efficiency and others would think of that as perhaps maybe 
uh, uh, the genetic by environment interaction in a beef cow. So why are you passionate about your area of expertise and helping ranchers? Yeah, so I mean, I, I've always enjoyed working with ranchers and learning from them because, you know, there, there are so many different environments and so many ways to go about doing things and so, so many different uh, resources and so on that, you know, you, you just never stop learning. And it's just a lot of fun. And sometimes, you know, I have knowledge or skills that they need and I can help them out in one way or another. Uh, for example, uh, one of my recent graduate students, uh, Megan Gross, who you know, mm -hmm. helped me uh, revise our beef cattle nutrition software program. And there are farms and ranches all over the country using that beef, cow ca or beef cattle nutrition evaluation software program. It's getting downloaded to the rate of around 2,500 copies of it a year. And so, you know, that's, that's pretty cool when you can do something, put something together that people, uh, you know, they, they vote with their feet. They, they're telling you that it's, it's a useful product by downloading and using it. And so I enjoy, you know, to me that is rewarding, being able to help people like that. That is very cool, and I'll have to give Megan a little bit of a hard time because I don't think she told me that that's what she was doing down there. Maybe she did, and I missed yeah, it. But... That's one of, the, one of the many things she did, but she did a great job on that. So diving right into the topic at hand today, cow efficiency, I would like to start this conversation by learning about what your opinion, in your opinion, what is that ideal cow? What is she doing? What does she look like? My definition of an ideal cow would be one that is resilient, uh, meaning is productive in the best of environments and still productive in the worst of years. Okay, whether that be drought or flood, uh, parasites, whatever. A cow that uh, is really uh, very productive in, in a given environment. Um, and, and then of course, our program is focused on trying to find cows that can be very productive and yet not cost a lot. So my definition of an ideal cow is one that is very productive, lasts a long time, course has a calf every year and can do all those things without eating you out of house and home. So can you dive a little bit into what the definition of a productive cow is? Talk a little bit more about that because I, I that can be a little broad sometimes. Yeah so I you know for a, a, a an operation that's focused on harvesting forage and, you know, primarily the cow-calf segment, you know, it is going to be critical uh, that they, they wean a calf every year. And so fertility would be at the top of my productivity measurement criteria. Um, and, then, and then next is, you know, if, if, if they're going to get pregnant, we can check that box if they're going to get pregnant every year. Of course, you'd like for them to be productive in terms of weaning, maybe some people might think of it as a big percentage of her body weight. Uh, but a cow that can give adequate amount of milk, but at the same time maintain her body condition. That is a productive cow. So how does, you touched on it a little bit, but how is, does this ideal cow in your mind relate to the overall profitability of generational ranches? Yeah, so, well, for example, uh, you know, we, we find cows that, I, I've got a really cool example, if I, I'd share it to you, if we could show a graph, but we found this last year, Shay, we found in a set of, I don't remember, about 52 cows in that group, set of lactating cows, uh, we found one cow 
that was uh, eating more than expected, okay? She was a big eater. She consumed 38 pounds of grass hay a day on average. That cow was losing weight on a grass hay and mineral diet, and she was not producing very much milk. Okay, so, so think about that. She's losing weight, not producing very much milk, and eating a lot. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not a very good combination. There's another cow in the same contemporary group that's consuming substantially less. She's only, she's only consuming 32 pounds of hay, as I recall, um, and she is producing a lot of milk and gaining weight. And so on the, very, the other end of the spectrum, you know, there's a cow that is very productive because she is producing a lot of milk. She, I don't remember if I said she was gaining weight, but she was gaining weight. And, and, you know, if you just isolate those two things, a cow that can produce a lot of milk on nothing but hay and mineral and gain weight at the same time, that's a big deal. I mean, that, that, those are the kind of animals that you'd like to have. And, and then on top of that, of course, you, again, you'd like for them not to eat you out of house and home, like eat 45 pounds a hay a day to accomplish weight gain and a lot of milk production. But this cow didn't have to do that. She was, she was kind of a moderate uh, forage consumption cow. And so that's how I would, that's how I would, I look at it now that, of course, you know, conducting our research program, we're one of the few because of all the intensive labor and work we go to to gather all that data that producers don't get to see. Uh, but somebody has to do it in order for us to make progress and find those cattle. But obviously, the cow that can produce a lot of milk, gain weight, meaning maintain her body condition, and not eat a lot, is a cow that's going to be profitable over time because, well, over a long period of time, if you could create more and more of those, you could reduce or increase your stocking rate on the same land base. Hey folks, if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know that I love the Red Angus breed. And if you want to boost your cattle profitability, use Red Angus. It's celebrated as the beef industry's most favored female. Red Angus registrations have surged by 24% over the past decade with docile temperaments and environmental resilience. These cattle are not only easy to handle, but thrive in various conditions. Their premium carcass quality and exceptional maternal traits make them a valuable addition to any herd. Elevate your operation today with Red Angus. After you finish this podcast, listen to the Red Angus Remarks podcast to learn why Red Angus is the most favored female. You just talked about these cows that are have a high performance and they are efficiently using that forage that is available. So how can cattle producers isolate these females and these genetics within their herds today? Yeah. Well, we haven't gotten to the point yet where we can point to, a, let's say, a genetic selection tool uh, to allow them to, to find those kind of differences in their own herd. But there are some pieces that are available today uh, that should be helpful to them to, to make progress in that direction. So let me, uh, let me describe a, another experiment I think is really important and people need to be aware of. But, uh, you know, we asked the question, do, do dry matter intake EPDs that are available through quite a few of the breed associations now, but those dry matter EPDs are based on growing animals consuming a pretty high quality diet. Do they work for a cow? And so <clears throat> we launched off into a, a series of experiments to try to figure that out. And what we discovered at the end of the day, at four of our studies and three other studies we found in the literature, was that those, it appears that those dry matter intake EPDs designed for growing calves on a high quality diet actually seem to work reasonably well for a mature cow consuming a moderate to low quality forage diet. 
the correlation, the phenotypic correlation is around 0.4 up to about 0.7 in those seven different studies. But they all, all seven of those said the same thing. And that was that, yep, that dry matter intake EPD actually can be useful for a cow. So one thing to keep in mind to answer your question, Shay, what, what can they do now? You know, if you look at the genetic trend for selection for growth in the beef cattle industry, we are headed north rapidly. Okay, the genetic trend in yearling weight EPD is going up. And if anything, with genomics available now, we'll be able to do that faster and faster and more accurately as time goes by. And so when we calculated the influence of that on cow size, you know, based on USDA cow carcass weight since 1978, if you convert those cow carcass weights to live animal weights, live cow weights, it looks like mature cow size has been increasing at about the rate of just a little bit over seven pounds per year. And so if we stay on the same trend, and of course, mature cow size and yearling weight growth is highly correlated, as is carcass weight, mature cow size, highly correlated. And so if we continue down that path in 10 years, our cows will be on average about 70 pounds heavier than they are today. Well, the idea that this dry matter intake EPD uh, actually works for a cow now gives you maybe two tools to use to control appetite or feed intake in your cow herd. One is the mature cow weight EPD that some of the breeds produce, and the other one is this dry matter intake EPD. And we think you can use uh, those EPDs perhaps in combination to ensure, depending on each ranch's breeding objective, you know, if you really want to work hard at controlling appetite or or uh, and or cow size, uh, so that you can maintain a constant stocking rate or increase stocking rate as you improve on cow efficiency, uh, I think you ought to be thinking about maybe using the mature cow weight EPD and the dry matter intake EPD at the same time. Use them together and I think that's a pretty powerful way to ensure that uh, as selection for growth goes up in the industry you're not just creating cows with greater appetite meaning you should be reducing your stocking rate on the same land base over time. Another, another comment Shay just just kind of add to that a little bit uh, with that with that seven pound increase in mature cow size per year we calculated that um, that someone that had a 30 year career in the cattle industry and they just did they did nothing but selected for industry average growth over that 30 year career you should be grazing about 13% fewer cows today than you were 30 years ago. Okay, so that's the impact of that cow size on stocking rate over time based on overall industry average. So in some ways, do you think the industry has gone too far in selecting for specific growth traits and pushing for more performance? That's a good question. As it um, relates to profitability. I want to add that in there, as it relates to profitability. Okay, so the question was, have we gone too far? And, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of variation out there. There, there are some operations I'm headed to one next week, going to spend some time with them that have really focused on maintaining moderate sized cows trying not to have to reduce their stocking rate and and it's a seed stock operation and so they're trying to produce the same scenario for all of their commercial cow calf guys but then there you know then there are others that have their primary breeding objective is to is to service more you know industry wide increase um profitability in the post-weaning phase and so you know if you're 
if you're buying uh, bulls from someone with that focus, you know, you and and not paying attention to the cows, you probably are uh, increasing your cow cost over time. The other thing that that will do, uh, you asked if we had gone too far. The other thing, if you're not paying attention uh, to cow efficiency, in other words, cow size, feed intake in the cows, their ability to maintain their body condition, Okay, if you are not paying attention to those things as time goes by, uh, you know, you're, you are going to, uh, let's say, maybe uh, create a cow herd that's less resilient when times get really tough. Um, and so, you know, that's an important consideration along with the potential impact that the lower resilience, lower body condition in particular in a tough year, would have on on fertility or reproduction. So earlier, a uh, question or two back, you talked about, you know, how cattle producers can look at that dry matter intake and that mature cow size, both. That's a little easier for a seed stock producer who has that full suite of EPDs on hand to look at some of those traits. What about for the commercial cow calf producer who maybe doesn't have that genetic information readily available? Well, hopefully they do on the sires they're purchasing to put into their herd. I heard just today, I heard Dr. Bob Weber from Kansas State indicate that uh, the last three sires in a pedigree account for 87% of the genetics in your current cow herd. And so, you know, if you think about that, a cow's sire, uh, that cow's uh, paternal grandsire, and then the maternal grandsire, those three bulls account for 87% of the genetics that are standing out there in your herd right now. And so if you had, if you're, again, if your breeding objective is to prioritize moderate cost you know, not letting costs continue to creep up in your cow herd. Or another way to look at it would be what I call forcing you to artificially modify the environment. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that over time, what you have to do is continually increase the expensive inputs so that you don't have drastic reproductive failure. Okay, that's artificially modifying the environment. If you're holding your own on the artificial artificial modification or the expensive mm -hmm. feed inputs, trying to challenge your cows to make a living without, tr you know, uh, tremendous uh, increase in those expenses, um, then then yeah, you're going to need to prioritize. Uh, feed intake and mature cow weight. But let me let me give you a real quick example. Um, I downloaded uh, some data on 600, and I used Angus bulls because there's you know the most most data available there. And I only used downloaded sires that had a mature cow weight EPD accuracy of 0.5 or higher, and a dry matter intake EPD of 0.5 or higher. And then I just drew a vertical line through those bulls to show the average mature cow weight, the breed average mature cow weight, and then a horizontal line to show the breed average um, dry matter intake EPD. And now what you've got is four quadrants on this graph, you know, and uh, the the uh, in in my graph that I'm trying to describe to you, the top left quadrant represents uh, sires that would produce females with below breed average mature cow weight but above breed average feed intake okay and in, and as I recall on those large number of bulls I downloaded there was three or four of these Angus sires that were proven bulls that produce smaller cows that eat more now, why would you do that? Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? No, it doesn't. No. 
but the bottom right the bottom right quadrant of my graph shows sires that would produce females that are bigger body weight body weight size bigger than breed average and eat less now there weren't a whole lot of those sires but if if that winds up you know being the case uh, let me ask you this what's wrong with that <laughs> okay <I'm not> sure. <laughs> if they're a little bigger but they eat that on breed average standpoint they sire daughters that don't have to consume a lot of feed now granted they would have to check all the other boxes too mm -hmm. they would have to get bred every year just like the rest of our efficient cows they'd have to maintain their body condition they'd have to have good feet good docility on and on but that's how I think people can use that right now. And if you, if you have, again, if you have a priority in your operation, because those artificial modif modifying inputs are really expensive, because maybe you have to truck them into Nevada or wherever your place is, well, then maybe you ought to be looking for sires that fall in the bottom left quadrant which is which is sires that produce daughters that are below breed average in weight and below breed average in feed intake. I think that would ensure females that are low cost. And again, they still have to check all the other boxes. I think that's really cool and useful for almost anybody. Again, considering now it won't happen overnight. The last three sires, as we've already talked about, represent 87 percent so in just a few years you could definitely uh, create some of those you know those scenarios that is very neat and if you do want to share that visual or that graph i can definitely include okay. that either in the show notes or overlay it over the video as happy well, to if you happy have any to. resources so people can see that you bet the other thing i want to say shay is that you know over over the years, we started with mature cow weight as a proxy for feed intake. And that's why the breed associations have produced those EPDs. And it's a good place to start because in general, we know that bigger cows consume more feed, but it's not perfect. And that's why I think, yeah. So in other words, in our research program, we found big cows that don't eat very much mm -hmm. and still maintain their condition. We have found little cows that eat a lot just like my top left quadrant, right? Mm -hmm. And and we see that in every group we it, we test. But if that's all you've got is is mature cow weight as a proxy for feed intake and stocking rate and those kind of things, it, it's a good place to start. That is interesting, and that's been a conversation that um, has been on the show before when we were, I had... Um, Dr. Troy Rowan and some mm -hmm. folks with Series Tag. It's a tag over in Australia that has an algorithm where they're trying to measure forage intake for cows when they're out on pasture. So that okay. is always an interesting conversation when you have, you know, that there are little cows that are eating more and mm -hmm. larger cows that are eating less than the smaller cows. So I think that's something that we as an industry are getting better about keeping in mind, but it's important to remember that just looking at that um, mature cow size doesn't always correlate to how much yeah. they are consuming. I mean, it's a good place to start, but it's, but it's, but it's not perfect. So I do want to muddy the water a little bit with that one question that I asked earlier about, have we gone too far with pushing for performance? So we talked about it just looking at a cow-calf operation that is focused on profitability. But what about taking that same question and applying it to that animal that has to go all the way through the supply chain mm. and end up on the consumer's plate? Okay. Well, let's. how about we start answering your question with the cows in the top left quadrant? Okay. of our graph okay those are the smaller cows that eat more 
Okay, so first of all, you you probably have a little bit lower weaning weight in those females. And of course, you've got higher costs because they eat more than breed average. But next, when it comes time to sell them as cull cows, what do you have? You have less cull cow weight to sell. Again, there's a strong genetic correlation between mature cow weight and post weaning growth. And so you would anticipate that the progeny from those cows, unless you implemented a terminal sire breeding program, right, one that's targeted, of course, to post-winning performance, unless you did that, you would anticipate that you would have calves that would not be as productive in the post-winning phase also. And then if we shift to the bottom right quadrant of the graph, where we've got female sires that produce females that are above breed average and mature cow weight, but they consume less feed on average. Now you've got a female uh, that is going to uh, obviously consume less feed because they're below breed average and dry matter intake EPD. You'll have more cull cow weight to sell and and the strong genetic correlation suggests that you should have more post winning growth and the, the probability of finding genetics with better feed efficiency post weaning. So, you know, I think there is an opportunity there to, uh, I'm not going to say we can perfectly do both at the same time, control cow costs and create a, a, a rock star you know feed yard animal mm -hmm. but we can at least probably make some progress in that direction david is there anything that you're excited about or currently working on related to this topic that you would like to share with those cow calf producers who are out there listening today well as as you know and we've we've already hit on here in, in our discussion the, the cattle industry is changing rapidly and, and has actually for a long time, but with the genetic selection tools and the technology we have available, available today, it's changing faster than ever. Um, you know, we, we're really thrilled and excited to be seeing some of the differences in each contemporary group we see. And it's obvious that there is just tremendous low-hanging fruit because we, we have identified cattle that are just tremendous in terms of efficiency and converting forage to beef. Um, but what we really need to do, we're looking forward to and working hard to accomplish is find a way to help people practically uh, and cost effectively identify those animals in their contemporary groups out in their pastures. We're not there yet, but that's what we're working on and that's, hope, that's what we hope to achieve. All right. Well, before we wrap up the conversation today, any final thought either related to what we talked about today or just in general that you want to share with cattlemen and women? If you have an interest in this kind of work, you know, I would just I would just invite people to contact us and we're happy to discuss uh, the things that we're working on here at Oklahoma State and certainly invite you to come tour our facility and kind of see how we're measuring. We didn't talk much about mm -hmm. our actual facility and how we're going about this work, but we're measuring long stem dry grass hay intake on these individual animals. And we have a specialized uh, system or facility to do that. You know, Shay, we'd rather be doing that work out in the pasture, but again, mm -hmm we haven't figured out how to do that yet. And so the next best thing uh, we thought was to at least feed a diet that's pretty close to where a cow has to make her living. And that's long stem dry grass hay. It's not been processed, doesn't have concentrate in it. She's getting dry grass hay and mineral. Uh, but anyway, if people are interested, they're welcome to come visit. Well, Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that and putting that invite out to all those listeners. I appreciate you taking time to be on the show today and talk about your expertise and little cows, big cows, and <laughs> cows in between. Yeah. 
Thank you. I've enjoyed our conversation. Thanks for inviting me. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate each and every one of you as a listener. Now, if you have any feedback, follow-up questions, or even if you have a topic suggestion, please head to my website or message me on social media and let me know. I love to hear your thoughts. I'd like to hear any topic suggestions. That's the best way to help me produce content that's valuable to you. Have a great day and happy ranching.